Hello, and welcome to One World, One Health, where we take a look at some of the biggest problems facing our world. I'm Maggie Fox. This podcast is brought to you by the One Health Trust, with bite-sized insights into ways to help address challenges such as infectious diseases, climate change, and pollution. A One Health approach recognizes that everything on this planet, the animals, plants and people, and the climate and environment are all linked. When you're sick, before you need medicine, before you need surgery, before you need anything else at all, you need to breathe. The brain starts to die within minutes without oxygen. Oxygen is medicine for people undergoing surgery, for premature babies, and most of all, for people struggling with pneumonia from infectious diseases such as COVID. People around the world suffered from oxygen shortages as COVID sent tens of thousands to hospitals all at the same time. Hospitals not only lacked ventilators to help the sickest people breathe, they also ran out of oxygen. This was especially bad in India, which produces oxygen for medical and industrial uses, but the oxygen wasn't always in the places where it was needed. The One Health Trust is working to build a national medical oxygen grid, so this can't happen again. In this episode, we're chatting with Varun Manhas, Associate Director of Public Health Programs for the One Health Trust. He's leading this project. A lot of the problems all boil down to logistics. The solution? You might not believe this, but it's a phone app. Varun, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Maggie. Varun, can you tell us a little bit first about medical oxygen, when and how it needs to be used? So oxygen therapy basically is required whenever someone is actually going through respiratory distress. And it can happen because of the clinical condition you're going through. You can have pneumonia. You can have a chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. You can have asthma. You can actually be a newborn child or you can actually be a new mother who's actually just delivered. And you could actually be going through a heart attack episode as well. You may be sort of asthmatic from birth. So these are the common sort of conditions where oxygen therapy is required. So medical oxygen is needed in a lot of different circumstances. What do you mean when you talk about an oxygen grid? The National Medical Oxygen Grid is basically managing your supply and demand and also understanding the utilization of your assets, also understanding their functional status, whether they're broken. And the second thing is it also helps you predict your future demand of your future demand of oxygen, and it could be disease-specific demand of oxygen as well. The idea for this National Medical Oxygen Grid for India came out of a really scary crisis during COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? So pre-COVID, the demand of medical oxygen in India was about 700 metric tons per day. So if I can convert that into cylinders, about 70,000 cylinders per day. Whereas the manufacturing capacity was about 10,000 metric tons per day, or the capacity that was available for medical use. But in the first wave, which was around September 2020, the demand went up by four times to about 3,200 metric tons per day. So we did, we did all right in the first wave. But in the second wave, which was around last week of April 2021 to first week of May 2021, the demand further increased to about 12,000 metric tons per day. And that is where we started struggling with the supply. 12,000 metric tons per day means it's basically about 1.2 million cylinders per day. There was a problem of manufacturing. We had manufacturing plants, but they were not in, evenly distributed in the country. Then we had problem of transport. We did not have enough tankers to move the oxygen around. Then we had problem of storage at hospital sites because not many hospitals had LMO tanks to store oxygen. And finally, there were issues related to black marketing and pricing of oxygen. What was going on in the hospitals when, when people were lacking this oxygen? What did it look like? I think it was a very sort of uh, difficult situation to be in. And a lot of people actually got cheated as well because there were people selling concentrators, selling cylinders with, and selling empty cylinders, saying that there is oxygen inside. There was shortage of beds in the hospitals as well. And even though the government of India did develop a lot of portals and platforms for people to sort of check in their vicinity, which has like a hospital that has available beds so that people don't waste time finding beds. But then imagine handling a population of about 1.4 billion people. There were a lot of, I think, deaths related to shortage of medical oxygen. And Varun, what was, what was your role during this time? You, of course, lived through the pandemic yourself as a person, but you were also involved in this industry. What was going on for you? 
I was working in the auction control room in one of the state governments and I remember like we had people around the clock sitting on telephone lines and taking calls from hospital managers, private hospital owners and also the patients asking us for more oxygen and asking us for information to tell them where auction is available and where a bed is available. And those two weeks, as I mentioned, April last week, 2021, and May 1st week, 2021, I think those are the times that nobody wants to go through them again. And I cannot justify in words or express myself in words in the kind of situation that people were in during those times. There was a private hospital owner who called, and I think his actual capacity of ICU beds was around 40. But then just because the demand of oxygen was so high and people were so critically ill, he enhanced it to about 150 ICU beds. And imagine you have to give about 15 LPM fluoride per bed. So each ICU bed is consuming about four to six cylinders per day. And with 150 ICU beds, about 600 to 800 cylinders. And he actually called us in such a desperate sort of situation where he said, I only have about 40 cylinders, whereas I need 300 to 400 cylinders in the next three to four hours. Otherwise, you know, a lot of people have been losing their lives. I'm not sure if he followed up on that because we did not have oxygen to deliver. I don't know what went on. So yeah, it's pretty sad. We know from the pandemic how important it is for health systems to work right when we need them. Communication is key. Does this app help hospitals do that? So to truly make it as a grid, you need to understand the consumption patterns or the availability of oxygen sources in the nearby hospitals. Let's say I'm a hospital A and I see that within a couple of days, my oxygen supply is going to be exhausting. But then the portal will also give me access to the nearest facilities around me, the facilities that will have available oxygen for sharing. And it will only show those facilities whose seven-day demand is already being met. Similarly, this is for oxygen, but it may happen that the facility may be running out of beds as well. It will also show you the bed availability in those nearby facilities. So you can actually redirect patients from your hospital to the other hospital because you know they'll definitely find a bed there. And then you can also request movable assets of oxygen, which are basically gaseous cylinders and concentrators. So this allows one hospital to communicate with another, share resources. Absolutely. So for pandemic preparedness, for example, it helps you in the planning Based on the beds you have in your hospital, you can estimate what's your daily demand going to be like. And that's based on your bed and bed occupancy. But then during the pandemic, you can understand your bed occupancy will probably go almost close to 100%. Or it might have to be doubled because you may increase the number of beds. So the tool will actually be able to tell you what, based on your bed occupancy, what your demand could be. And based on that, you can actually sort of diversify your oxygen sources. And then based on your bed occupancy, as well as we do not know what the disease-specific demand of oxygen is as of now. But through this portal, we are going to be collecting data over months and years. And then based on that, we can understand what is the average flow rate that is given to a patient who's suffering from pneumonia? What is the average flow rate that is given to a patient who's suffering from asthma? So based on that, you can also understand what is the disease-specific demand of oxygen. So this app does the math for the hospital administrators as well. So based on your bed occupancy, we will estimate what your consumption for that day should be. And then you are already reporting on your assets, utilization and consumption. Then we will calculate the difference and it will tell you what's the difference. And if the difference is greater than 50%, it will tell you that, that the hospital has to conduct an audit. Either there is a leakage in the medical gas pipeline system. That's why you're using too much oxygen. Or the nurses are not familiar with the flow rates that have to be used with specific delivery devices. Either you're using too much oxygen. And the issue is not only about overuse of oxygen. It could be also about underuse of oxygen. If your utilization is actually 50% lower than estimated, that's also a problem. Mainly that you're not giving oxygen therapy adequately in, in the hospital. I think it's a game changer. So while we were developing this, we did a lot of research on existing data systems. And mind you, in India, the government of India actually developed three different systems. And we observed that there were a lot of limitations in those. Of course, during the pandemic, they actually helped a lot in decision making. But then with hindsight, we thought, why not develop something even better? And we came across a lot of limitations, such as they were not integrated each other. Some of the platforms are only capturing some assets. Then they did not have a phone app. In our system, we have a phone app and you can enter the data in offline mode as well. So let's say if you want to use a system in a rural setting and maybe there is a power cut or you do not have you know data available for data transfer, you can do the data entry to begin with in offline mode. And then once you have access to data, it can be uploaded to the main service. And one important feature that we developed, imagine a very large hospital, which has about 4,500 beds. So in the previous platforms we observed, there was only one person who could enter the data. So that person had to make sure 
he had to collect all the data, validate it, and then submit it. But we've created this concept of master and satellite user. So there is one master within a facility who will sort of monitor data that is being collected and he'll be the file authority who submitted the data to main server. But then he can also create multiple satellite operators and we've not set any limit on it. So you can give a task for one particular asset or one particular bed type to one person and you're reducing the data entry burden for that person. And with that, you're also ensuring the accuracy of the data. Also, we put in a lot of checks as well. If at all we feel the system feels the data that is being entered is incorrect, it will give a warning and it will not accept the data for submission. So with these sort of features, I think we haven't come across and we presented the same thing to WHO and they really appreciated our efforts. And because of that, we've been invited to present the same portal in a meeting that is happening in a couple of weeks now in Senegal, which is the auction roadmap meeting. If there had been a grid like this in place before COVID, would lives have been saved? Absolutely, because it would have helped me in the planning, right? And uh, believe me, you, even today, if you go back to the state governments and ask them, could you please declare the number of assets you have? Believe me, you, not many would be able to answer this question. And this is post-pandemic. So if we had National Medical Auction Grid pre-pandemic, we would have actually got real-time information on you know the assets available, their functional status. So the huge challenge would have been with the data entry. As I said, one person expected to enter data for the entire hospital and the hospital is a large hospital it would be challenging. So with the concept of having this master and data entry operators, you actually, you know, negate that sort of uh, challenge completely. And with the feedback that we received from, you know, 70 odd hospitals that we've implemented this grid so far, they're saying this is the best system that have come across. And I think maybe this concept of satellite and master would be sort of, you know, taken up in other health portals because you can't expect one person to, you know, collect the data and then validate the data. And then it will definitely help in equity, ensuring with the density of the population in that region, they should have a number of beds. Because as of now, it will be very difficult for them to quantify a number of beds in each district as well. So with, we are capturing that information that will be possible. And then also it will help in optimal, you know, procurement decisions. For example, you have District A. They have a lot of cylinders, but their historic demand and the current demand is very low. But then you suddenly see District B that has a surge. So should District B procure new cylinders or new assets, or should they actually request District A to share these assets with them? It will at least give data to the decision makers so that they can take decisions on how they want to distribute auction sources. And it could be, you know, data bad decision making rather than, you know, based on anecdotes and, you know, just assumptions which are not sort of concrete. So by default, let's say if, if you're using this portal in one of the states, the hospital does not have flexibility to say that we do not want to share data with the administrators. It's by default, the data would be shared. And there's no way they can actually prevent that from happening. And the state will actually make it as a policy in their state to say that this portal has to be utilized on daily basis. Data has to enter on daily basis. There is another important feature on the portal called portal update. So when you click on that feature in the portal, automatically it will generate a list of hospitals who have not entered data for that particular day. And immediately the government can take action, start calling them up and start telling them that there will be strict action against you if you do not start utilizing the portal. So who's paying for all this? So the initial support has to come from non-profits where we actually generate evidence through piloting and uh, or implementation in small geography. Then based on that, we actually try and convince the government that they have to take the ownership because the majority of the cost is basically in developing such systems. And we've already spent that money with, and we were generously funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for that. Now it's basically taking the ownership of the platform. So it's not going to cost the government a lot of money in taking the ownership. So they'll have to host this platform on their own servers. Uh, we are happy to train their engineers as well on you know managing the portal as well. So the cost could be, if it's a very minimal cost, I think the minimal cost would be around $500 per year. And the maximum it could be about, let's say, around four thousand dollars per year. So that's the cost the government has to bear for continued implementation in the state. Five hundred dollars total? Yeah, because the thing is, before we hand it over to the government, we actually fix all the bugs. There are no technical sort of issues. And we're not expecting any major upgrades in the system in the coming years. So if at all we hand over the portal as it is, the only cost for them is they need to sort of pay for the web domain name that is going to be used for hosting the platform on a web portal. Then also they'll have to pay one-time cost to Google to host the app on Android, which is about $25. And then additional cost of about $99 to host the app on Apple Play Store. And then some additional cost on getting the security certificate. So so it total amounts to around $500 per year. So One Health Trust with funding from the Gates Foundation is doing all the hard work. When the government assumes this, they're basically just assuming the very minimum care it takes for an app. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've actually done the bulk of research. We've done a lot of field work to understand the oxygen ecosystem in the country. So a lot of uh, time has gone into designing and then development. And of course, when once you go into implementation, the majority of the cost would also be on capacity building. So this would be really easy to translate to other countries. All they have to do is get this app that does all the work for them and you can run a national oxygen grid off a smartphone. Is that what you're really saying? Absolutely. So yeah, it's easy to sort of scale up to any other countries or expand to other geographies. One major thing we'll have to be concerned about is the translation cost. Then the second cost would be because we use specific terminologies or nomenclature for assets in India. So we'll have to just sort of tailor those sort of names to which would be relevant to the local geographies. So within two to four weeks of the governments of these countries showing interest, we can actually make these changes quickly. Varun, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me and it was lovely chatting with you. Listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it. You can learn more about this podcast and other important topics at onehealthtrust.org. And let us know what else you'd like to hear about at owoh at onehealthtrust.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to One World, One Health, brought to you by the One Health Trust. I'm Ramanan Lakshminarayan, founder and president of the One Health Trust. You can subscribe to One World, One Health on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on social media at One Health Trust, one word, for updates on One World, One Health and the latest in research on One Health issues like drug resistance, disease spillovers, and the social determinants of health. Finally, please do consider donating to the One Health Trust to support this podcast and other initiatives and research that help us promote health and well-being worldwide. Until next time.